How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. Are you thinking about a career in genetic counseling? Maybe you're already a current student or even a recent grad. Then you have to head over to our social media for a major giveaway right now. We've assembled 15 genetic counselors, including myself and some other familiar faces, voices, if you catch my drift. All 15 of us are going to be mentors for lucky 15 listeners. That's right. You can meet with us for a one-hour Zoom call for a one-on-one mentoring session. This is a giveaway, so you can just go to our Instagram and Twitter and then my personal LinkedIn, Kira Deneen to enter for free for an extra 10 entries. That's right. An extra 10 entries. You can leave a rating review on Spotify or Apple. Hey, if you want 20 extra entries, do both. Then email that to info at dnapodcast.com. And I will personally give you an extra 10 entries. Again, we're going to have 15 winners. So you've got a really good shot. If you leave a rating review, you tag some friends on social media, you share it on your Instagram story. Um, We're really, really excited for this. I am very passionate about helping people get into the genetic counseling profession. If you couldn't tell already, we have a lot of episodes about this. And just want to give a shout out to GC Prep for being our sponsor for this giveaway. We are so excited. So head over to our social media. There's also a link in the show notes to access the giveaway. There's no way I'm the only one that's getting sick of Zoom conferences. (laughs) Um, It's great to be able to talk with people from all over the world, but I have to say the in-person conference, there's nothing quite like it. So I'm really excited to be going to the Connecticut Genetic Counselors Association's first conference in person. Jackson Laboratory is gracious enough that they're going to be hosting us on Friday, October 14th, and they're in Farmington, Connecticut. So that's in the middle of Connecticut. Um, I'm honored to be moderating for the Roe versus Wade panel, where we're going to be discussing the implications for practicing in safe harbor state like Connecticut, New York, other states around us. Other presentation topics include polygenic risk scores, inclusive practice for LGBTQIA plus patients, billing, credentialing. We're packing a lot in. We also built in networking time so that we can meet you, chat, get to know each other. So really looking forward to this. There's a link in the show notes to register. Um, It's $25 if you're going for no no CEUs, and then it's 50 if you're going for CEUs. Um, And it's three hours worth of CEUs. So pretty decent. Really hope I get to see you there. Today is a fellow genetics podcaster, Effie Parks. She's the host of Once Upon a Gene, so that's why her voice is probably going to be familiar to you. The show explores the true stories of raising rare kiddos. The podcast has a long list of accomplishments. I'll share a couple with you. The podcast was awarded Best in Show Podcast by WeGo Health. Podcast Magazine recognized Effie as one of the 40 under 40 podcasters, and she's been nominated for two Champion Hope Awards from Global Genes. Thank you so much for coming on, Effie. I feel like I know you, even though we've actually not podcasted back and forth before. <laughs> yes, Kira. Oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, of course I know Kira, but, but this is the first time we're making it happen. I'm so honored to be here. Thanks for having me on your awesome show. Um, and thank you for sharing all of that information about Once Upon a Gene. Hopefully we do have some overlap of listeners. You know, we definitely have a lot of nerdy people liking our stuff. So hi, yes, everybody. I- yeah, we definitely, definitely have overlap. And then I was really happy that you reached out for me to be featured on a recent episode, episode 143, um, that had the theme, I'll never forget. And you collected all these great stories featuring genetic counselors that shared these impactful rare disease stories. Um, and it was a really great episode. I really enjoyed listening to it. The other genetic counselors were just fantastic on the show. Yeah. Um, so everybody's got to go check that out. We'll link to that in the show notes. Um, and I love how in your episodes you include Ford's Laugh for those that need a little pick-me-up in their day. So I want to hear more about the little boy behind the laugh. Tell us about Ford. Oh, my gosh. First of all, yes. Do, stop what you're doing and just go to the last 30 seconds of any episode and listen to that laugh. 
Like, you will not. I will pay you money if you can actually not smile or laugh out loud on your worst day listening to it. Uh, Ford is... I have not accomplished that so far. <laughs> I always smile a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's such a funny little guy. We always joke because Casey and I are just like, how did we get, like, the class clown kid? Because we're just not like that. Um, yeah, he's so sweet. He's six years old. He just started first grade today. Um, he's amazing and he's so willful and always will try to figure out a way to make people laugh. He loves being a jokester and he drives around like evil Knievel in his wheelchair. It's terrifying. (laughs) Sort of get used to it, but yeah, he's just such an amazing kid and he's really surprising us over the last couple months, even with some of the development that he's been working on. And we're just, we're just so in love with that little dude. Yeah, yeah, he's such a little cutie. Um, and it's just been fantastic to hear Ford's story, you know, with, through Once Upon a Gene, through your podcast, and also just how it affects family and just family life and bringing on other rare disease advocates um, and parents and everybody that kind of falls under that rare disease community umbrella. Um, you know, looking back in terms of Ford's history, Do you remember when you first noticed a sign that Ford might have a health issue, might be atypical compared to other kids when he was that age? Yes, we actually noticed something was wrong right away with Ford, even though nobody agreed with us, and then later found out through medical records that he did in fact have inner utero growth restriction. So there were some red flags that didn't ever get relayed to us as parents. Um, But right when Ford was born, he had a really low birth weight. He was like four pounds, nine ounces, and we couldn't get him to latch, suck, swallow, nothing. He basically got zero food for the first couple days. And then afterwards at home, we still had so much trouble feeding him. It would take hours to get a couple ounces down him. And that went on for a few months until finally we got someone to listen and agree that something was in fact wrong with Ford. Yeah, so I'm sure it was that parent intuition of like, no, something's off. Um, And just oftentimes I hear from so many rare disease advocates, especially those that are the parents and the caregivers. It's like, no, we had to keep fighting and be like, no, something's different. I want to explore this further. I want to understand this to help my baby, my child. Um, And so eventually kind of fast forwarding, Ford was diagnosed with a rare disorder, um, CTNNB1 syndrome. So... Obviously, there was probably a process between what you talked about and then the actual diagnosis. But what is the test that actually gave you that diagnosis? Was there a genetic counselor involved? Of course, I have to ask that because I'm a genetic counselor. So I'm always curious. (laughs) Yes, fast forwarding. So at four months, he was admitted into a children's hospital and that got the ball rolling um, and, you know, ensued the millions of appointments then on. And eventually, pretty close to that appointment, we did get referred to genetics Um, And the geneticist was actually quite intrigued with Ford's case because she was very convinced that she had pinpointed what it was just by looking at him. If you look at a picture of Ford, he is extremely pale and white. He has these neon blue eyes and he, um, especially when he was a baby more so. Uh, So she thought he had a form of albinism called HPS, Hermansky-Pudlak syndrome, and ordered a whole exome sequencing test. It did not come back with that diagnosis, thankfully. Um, but that's that's kind of how it went down. It took, a, it took about six months for us to get those results. They kind of got lost in transit at one point um, with healthcare stuff, you know? Um, so it was a surprise to get a diagnosis at all. And it was also a shock. And it was also like, well, thank God I don't have to worry about the sun and a lung di- a, a lung transplant in a, you know, a decade or so. Um, so there was a lot going on. There were lots of, there was lots of balls in the air about what was wrong with Ford. Yeah, that's certainly a lot to go through. And I, I've heard that from many people that like six months to sometimes get results back because and this was a few years ago, so I think that's that's a good perspective. I don't know if that's necessarily the case if for you know newborns today and everything that are doing the whole exome sequencing. Um, and for those that aren't familiar, whole exome sequencing is where we're looking at all the genetics that are active and turned on in our body to see if there's any genetic change in there 
that could, like in Ford's case, lead to a specific diagnosis for a condition. Um, so it sounds like you got that from the exome there. Correct. Yes. The CT and MB1 came back from that. Um, we oddly had a secondary um, thing pop up on his test, which we're exploring um, at this point. So maybe you can help me with that. <laughs> but, but yeah, maybe. it was. <laughs> well, or I'll connect you with a PhD genetic counselor. It knows even more. Um, but yeah, I mean, with whole exome sequencing, it's you get so much back. Yeah. This is definitely when I felt like such a soft spot in my heart for genetic counselors themselves because the dynamic between our genetic counselor and our geneticists were so different and how I felt, you know, just generally supported um, was was quite different. And I felt like the genetic counselor reached out to me so much um, in offering like ways to help or something. And I never feel like I got that from our geneticist. Yeah, I, you know, another thing that I, I feel that what genetic counselors can bring, and, and part of it is, too, I think the timing that oftentimes genetic counselors have more time in their day to be doing that. Um, so we certainly have that luxury. and definitely differs different places. Um, but it's, it's good to hear that you did have a good experience with a genetic counselor and that they could support you through the process and checking in um, and that a, a geneticist was involved. That, that makes sense um, in the pediatric setting with everything. Perkinell Emer Genomics is a global leader in genetic testing, focusing on rare diseases, inherited disorders, newborn screening, and hereditary cancer. Testing services support the full continuum of care from preconception and prenatal to neonatal, pediatric, and adult. Testing options include sequencing for targeted genes, multiple genes, the whole exome or genome, and copy number variations. Using a simple saliva or blood sample, Perkin-Elmer Genomics answers complex genetic questions that can proactively inform patient care and end the diagnostic odyssey for families. Learn more at perkinelmergenomics.com. Have you heard of TrackGene? TrackGene is a clinical genetic software solution used by over a thousand genetic experts around the world. You can customize the front page so it's streamlined to your specific workflow. The intuitive patient information entry page makes data entry efficient and user-friendly. Pedigrees are also easy to draw and document. Here's another vital feature. It supports HL7 integration to be used with other clinical genetic software, databases, and hospital information systems. So you can build custom reports with the simple drag and drop report builder. This has an interface with data visualization tools such as those from Microsoft to make it easy workflow. And there's more features on the way, all designed with you in mind as the genetics expert. TrackGene has an experienced team who's been working in the clinical genetic industry for, get this, over 15 years. You can request a demo for free. Go to trackgene.com. Again, that's T-R-A-K, gene, so track without the C, dot com. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes of DNA Today, where we're going to be chatting with TrackGene. Support for DNA Today comes from the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, also known as PETA, whose scientists have developed the Research Modernization Deal, a strategy to phase out ineffective experiments on animals with high-tech, state-of-the-art research. PETA has collected an abundance of evidence demonstrating that the use of animals in biomedical research hinders scientific progress and puts patients at risk. Learn more at PETA.org slash New Deal. Again, that's PETA.org slash New Deal. interesting that at least at the time there was only what 30 other people who were diagnosed with with ct and nb1 that ford was diagnosed with i mean how did you begin to even navigate all this you talked about your mindset once you actually got the results of like okay it's not albinism so it's this different condition but then once you wrapped your head around this new condition i mean where where did you begin Mm, yes, I was horrified <laughs> and, um, you know, did what every parent does, right? Dr. Google, all the things. Uh, eventually found Facebook groups at this point. Uh, so I Googled in there or Facebook, you know, searched in there and I came across a CTNNB1 family awareness group. And there were actually 50, 50 patients at this point. So you know how that goes with knowing everything when you're delivering information. And I felt so relieved in that moment, you know, that there were other people and that I could go in there and be like, oh, my gosh, help me. Um, so that was nice to have 
the the kids were all so little, you know, so it was almost kind of a bummer too because I had all these questions and I had all I was feeling all this stuff and nobody could really give that to me because their kids were the same age practically. Um, there was a couple further ahead at this point, but um, there wasn't anything to look for. There wasn't any like future <laughs> premonitions of what Ford's life might be like. Um, so while it was nice to know we weren't completely alone, it wasn't super comforting either. Yeah, yeah, I've certainly... Um, we had uh, Patty Hall on the show, who's a, a Canadian author, and, and she shared that it was really helpful when her son was diagnosed with gigantism to be able to reach out to people that were a few years older to see, as you're explaining, like, okay, what issues have come up down the line that maybe I can prepare myself for, or, oh, wow, developmentally, they've actually um, hit more milestones or whatever the case may be of, you know, both sides of having, okay, this is what we have to look forward to. And also this is what we have to prepare for. Um, so I can't imagine how tough that is if, if all the kids are kind of around the same age with it. And, and it is a rare disorder. So it makes sense that you're not going to have that many people to be able to talk to. Um, and some people listening might be like, okay, they've talked about this rare genetic disorder, but how does it actually affect Ford? You mentioned that he uses a wheelchair to be mobile. Um, how else does it affect Ford's body and um, in general? A lot. Yeah. So so Ford's protein, the beta catenin, isn't it's you know, it's, he's getting about 50 percent of the beta catenin protein that his body needs um, that we all need for all of his cells to do all of their jobs. Uh, the way it shows up for Ford is definitely more severe than most of the children. I'd say him and about three other kids are probably similar. Uh, so he has a he has a really severe movement disorder, and you know he has dystonia in his limbs. He's hypotonic in his trunk area, um, so he still can't sit unassisted. He can't crawl. Uh, he can't walk. Obviously, the wheelchair. He's also never been able to swallow, and um, all of that function is part of his hypotonia. So he uses a G tube for his feeding and has since he was four months old. Um, let's see, Ford has uh, microcephaly, so his head is a smaller in diameter, and he has eye, eye issues, severe eye issues, um, strem business, one of his eyes is kind of stuck now, we will see if we, you know, want to do that whole surgery of putting it back, if that even works, who knows, Kira, um, he's nonverbal, although... Yeah. Uh, just within the last couple months, one of the drugs that we've um, upped the dosage on has brought out some words, which is like mind blowing, and we're all freaking out about it because he's trying to say things now. It's so Isn't exciting! It amazing. Wow. Um, yeah. So this drug is for his movement disorder that he takes, and then all of a sudden, when we upped it, he started blub blubbing, and we were like. Oh my God. Okay. So I have something to look forward to that I really never expected at this point. I had just assumed, okay, Ford's nonverbal and that's the way that it is. So things are changing right now that is very cool, but he's really good at his AAC device. It's a, an iPad that kids use to communicate with other people. And, you know, he's developed a lot of these skills. He's really smart. Um, he definitely has an intellectual disability because of his, his syndrome, but man, that kid is really really smart and his receptive language is just it's perfection um obviously i think that it is selective sometimes um which might just be my opinion oh, sure <laughs> what parent doesn't right but yeah ford he has trouble gaining weight he has trouble but it's sleeping. great that he has all these tools yes yes um it's just amazing and he has so many great therapists at school especially that just adore him and really take the time to get to know him and help him develop them you know alongside his peers which is important yeah yeah certainly and just you know I'm just thinking like it's his first day of first grade today I'm sure that's on your mind and kind of like okay when's the bus coming and everything um I think along you know these lines of learning about how this affects Ford Going back to when you first learned about this diagnosis, you and your partner, Casey, what are some resources that if you could go back and talk to, you know, 
that version of yourself of, in that point in time, if you had a time machine, um, are there certain resources that you wish you knew about that you would have shared or when there are new parents in the community that you're like, oh, we really encourage you to check this out or, you know, a certain doctor or certain um, health organization, um, anything off the top of your head that you're like, oh, this is a go to resource. Yeah, like a million now and some that weren't there, <laughs> one of which I created because it wasn't there. Right. Like that's where Once Upon a Gene was born is where I was desperately searching for parents like me and to figure out this whole landscape of this rare disease world that I was now thrust into um, in the last couple years it's exploded and it's so amazing every time I see a new you know blog or podcast pop up I'm like yes because parents really need that personal connection and they need to build that personal community um, other things I didn't know about and wasn't told about until the digging ensued was things like Global Genes, things like Nord, things like the Every Life Foundation, things like, you know, all of those beautiful hubs um, that you can go to for support and toolkits and things. And also just to kind of really figure out, like, where you fit um, in terms of if you want to do anything advocacy wise, right? Like if you're passionate about helping to get laws changed or healthcare equity or, you know, rare disease storytelling or IEP stuff, like you really can find these groups now and figure out like, hey, you know what? I'm good at this or this is actually what I'm passionate about now. And you can jump in. Um, it helps with the stress and the trauma, I really think. And it also just informs you and it gets you deeply entangled in this beautiful community to really help you kind of figure it out and get things done faster and copy people's homework, right? So your job doesn't have to be as hard as the parent before you. Um, most importantly, though, find your find your people, like find them. I, I mean, I think I have lots of them for you to find, but really connect with the parents who are living the life that you're living because they're the ones who are going to be your go-tos for so many of your personal questions and they're going to know the answers and they're going to know where to direct you and they're your best resource and they're everyone's best resource including yours including all industry like the caregivers and the patients are the people that you need to be friends with totally agree i had a um i've had a few different cases as a prenatal genetic counselor where um, through a procedure called an amniocentesis, we ended up having um, a couple diagnoses of rare conditions. And what I did as a genetic counselor was, okay, I'm gonna find, hopefully there's an organization or some kind of parent group, caregiver group, and see if anyone is willing to chat with me so I can learn more about the condition. And if they're open to it, I can connect my patient with them. Um, and. I think that's just so great because I can't speak to raising a child that has whatever condition we're talking about. And I think that's just, there's so much power in that connection and being able to ask questions that I, I'm not going to know what that daily life is like. Um, so I think that's a resource, as you said, for everybody to take advantage of. And the rare disease community is so embracing. It's just such a beautiful community. Um, I can't think of another community like it, to be honest. Um, I'm involved in, you know, over the years, different volunteer groups and everything, and, and there's some that are great, but there's nothing like the rare disease community. You know, it really is just so strong. And I, I think you gave some great shout outs. We'll have links in the, sh in the show notes and our website for Nord, Global Genes, Every Life. Did I get that last one right? Every Life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly that's a new one for exactly. me. Oh, yeah. You will be embraced and you will be seen and heard and they will help you. So whether that's emotionally or mentally or, you know, if you want to take action and start a foundation or do whatever, like everyone is so tight and everyone is so loving and like you will be embraced and you will be helped. <laughs> This is a shocking statistic. The National Institutes of Health, or NIH, the world's largest funder of biomedical research, squanders an estimated $200 billion of taxpayer money every year on ineffective animal experiments for human diseases. The NIH reports that failure rates for novel drugs occur in about 95% of human studies, despite showing success in preclinical experiments using animals. Animals and humans deserve better. 
which is why scientists for the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, aka PETA, have developed new strategies for replacing the use of animals in experiments with human-relevant methods. Advances in human-relevant research technologies hold tremendous promise to revolutionize biomedical research and usher in the age of personalized medicine, a topic we explore extensively on DNA Today. Head over to PETA.org slash New Deal to learn more. Again, that's PETA.org slash New Deal. Did you know Perkin Elmer Genomics was one of the first laboratories to offer whole genome sequencing on a clinical basis? Whole genome sequencing can maximize clinical diagnostic yield for patients. With turnaround time of four weeks for the proband sample, Perkin Elmer's whole genome sequencing test is designed to provide access to additional valuable information compared to an exome. Perkin Elmer also offers prenatal whole genome sequencing as well as ultra rapid whole genome sequencing for critically ill newborns using dried blood spots. The ultra rapid genome has turnaround time of five days and includes mito, chromosomal CNV analysis, STR, TNR screening, and biochemical analysis. Also, listen back to episode 176 with Dr. Maduri Hegda, where we explore the power of whole genome sequencing, which also happens to be one of my favorite episodes of DNA Today. And stay tuned for a couple more episodes with Perkin Elmer soon. Discover all that Perkin Elmer Genomics has to offer at perkinelmergenomics.com. TrackGene has designed a genetics electronic health record. Here's what it features. Pedigrees, demographic data, genetics information, risk tools, and sophisticated reporting, all within a clinician-designed workflow. It integrates with other clinical genetic software, databases, and hospital information systems to maintain accurate patient records. Go check it out at trakgene.com. Again, that's trackgene, without the C, dot com. And keep your eye out for our full episode interviews with trackgene coming soon to DNA Today. And another question I wanted to ask you about is you have another child, Esme. Am I, am I getting her name right? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So how was it? adjusting to life with a second child. I mean, I think a lot of rare disease parents, especially if they're first born, like for you has a rare disease, they might be in that process of deciding, okay, do we want to have a second child? What this might look like for our family and what's the impact on our current child that may have the rare disease. Um, can you share a little of your experience, advice you may have for parents that are, you know, having these conversations right now? Yeah. For me personally, I knew that I wanted a bigger family, um, so it was almost like non-negotiable for my husband and I to ha to not have another child. That we wanted to give that to ourselves as parents who uh, hasn't haven't really had the opportunity to experience what we thought we were going to experience. So selfishly, that reason. Also, we wanted a sibling for our beautiful son Ford, and we just didn't feel like it was complete. Um, I felt safe. <laughs> in that CT and NB1 wasn't something that was passed on to Ford, you know, it was a de novo, it was just a fluke. Um, so I knew that it was the same possibility that anyone had on having Ezzy, right? I didn't have some percentage staring me in the face that something could definitely happen. Um, so that was reassuring. I did have a CVS, CVS? CSV? Yep, C you got it. <laughs> it was sort of an amniocentesis, but not really. And they did actually send it to Baylor, too, to see if CT and one was in there, just in case. Who knows? Never say never. Um, but yeah, once Ezzy came around, like, it was just, there was so much more light, you know? And Ford was enamored by her, and I've already seen the person that she has become at a three-year-old age that I can't even believe. And she's going to do amazing things in this world. I know she is. And she keeps us on our toes. And I do joke about this, but I'm dead serious. Like I could be Ezzy's mom with my hands tied behind my back at this point compared to Ford. So when other parents call me and message me about like how afraid they are to have kids, like they're totally not going to be as hard as your rare kid. Like I promise, like no matter what anybody says, like if you want to do it, like really think about it and reach out to parents of, of rare kiddos who have done it and get their thoughts. But my opinion, it only makes your lives richer. It only gives more love in your family and you're creating people who become allies for people like Ford, which we need a lot more of. 
Yes, that is just beautifully stated. And and you're one of what, like 14? You are you come from a huge family. You have a lot of siblings, right? So it makes sense you wanted a bigger There's family. A lot. I remember like yeah. reading that and I was like, you've got a lot of siblings. Wow, that, that that's like a, a geneticist dream to have these big families. How does genetics play out in everybody? <laughs> um, so I just remember reading that and I was like, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Um, yes, but one of 13, also, you can study us anytime. Yes, okay, amazing. Who knows, might take you up on that. Um, and I wanted to congratulate you, um, and your family on Ford's feature and beyond the diagnosis. Can you share a little bit about this display, how it happened? I, I mean, I just saw it on social media. I'm like, this is really cool. Oh my gosh. Isn't that so cool? Okay. Patty Welton, what an amazing mom and advocate. She has daughters with EDS and, uh, she started this foundation called beyond the diagnosis where she, uh, gets artists to paint the photos of these beautiful children who have rare diseases and it's a traveling art exhibit. So Patty's mission is to, you know, reinforce that there's a face and a person and a beautiful child behind these diseases. And it's not just code and it's not just a name and they're not just a patient. Uh, but look, look at Ford and his wild hair and his one you know wonky eye like he's so amazingly cute look at these kids that you're doing this science for um so they travel to medical schools and industry pharma companies and they get put on the walls with a little blurb about these kids and these people who are actually working on these diseases in one way or another get to see their faces and it just makes such an important impact on the work that they do and you know it, I, I think it just gives them so much more humanity behind these names of these diseases and everything. Patty's amazing. Everybody should check out Beyond the Diagnosis. Um, yeah, I just submitted his name. So if you want to like think about doing it, go to beyondthediagnosis.com and fill out the form to maybe get your kiddos rare disease in that art exhibit. Uh, they don't ever tell you that your photo got ch uh, chosen until it's completely finalized. So it's a really big surprise when it happens. That kind of makes it more exciting almost be like, wow, it's here. Like, I didn't even know it might happen. Um, yeah, that's really cool. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, yeah, it's just a fantastic thing. And, and I think about when I was working in the lab, you know, you don't meet patients. You don't know whose samples you're working on. And it is really cool to be able to say, oh, wow, this kid on the wall has the disorder that I'm researching or that I'm working on samples to diagnose or something like that. It's just, it brings that human element to it that I think is so important because sometimes in the lab you're like, okay, next, next, next. And you're just like moving samples along and it's nice to pause and, and say, wow, I'm making an impact. And, and this is who I'm impacting. Um, or, you know, people, people like Ford, right? Um, so just really, really exciting um, to, to see that. Yeah. And it changes, it changes your, it changes everything. I mean, you Google things still, it's getting better now with advocacy foundations, just like revving up and rare disease being so exciting right now. But the photos that you Google before, when you search for the syndrome of your kid, they're horrifying. And it's not something that any parent should have to Google and see. And it's not realistic all the time. And our kids' faces deserve to be updated <laughs> in the literature and in everyone's mind who's working with these kids. Yeah, completely agree. There was a photographer that I met when I was in grad school in New York, um, and he runs Positive Exposure. I don't know if you've come across them. And he takes pictures of people with lots of different disorders. Rare diseases are certainly included. And it's really to replace those terrible, as you mentioned, like textbook photos where you have people with that bar over their eye to de-identify them over their eyes. Um, and usually it's like, you know, they're, they're standing in their underwear and then they've got like, you know, brick wall behind them. It's just, it's so kind of grossly clinical. Um, and it's just so mm -hmm. refreshing to see beyond the diagnosis, positive exposure, you know, bringing a way different light to that. So I hope when people are Googling parents like you, you know, six years ago that are seeing more of these images and less of those old textbook, I think we need to phase those out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely a really great, important point there. Um, and it was cool. I heard this summer that you attended a rare disease family meetup. Um, tell me about that. What, what is the experience like actually being in person with other rare disease families? 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. So CT and NB1 had like a mini uh, Middle America meetup and there was uh, under 20 families there. Um, and I got to meet some CT and NB1 families for the first time. And I joked about on my podcast that I'm going to create a game called, is it Ford or is it a girl? Because they're identical. I mean, these kids all look like siblings. It's bananas. Um, and it was just, my cheeks hurt so bad. I was smiling so much. Um, these kids were so similar, you know, they all sounded the same, they all moved the same and they all just had the best time and being in a room with parents who know exactly what your life is like is you, you can't explain it. The level of comfort and just like you just feel so at home and you feel so connected to these people and they're your family. Yeah. I mean, especially with, you know, all the kids really looking like their siblings, I'm sure that even brings another (laughs) level to that feeling like family. And, um, I mean, just, I can't imagine how, what beautiful immediate connections that you have with people and, and hopefully relationships that you can continue on. And, you know, especially with COVID, now, you know, being on, don't want to say that it's over, but being, being on the other side of it now, two years into it, um, almost three, I guess at this point, um, of being able to have these meetups and everything. Cause I know for years, people in the rare disease community were not doing that. And I, I'm starting to hear a little bit more of it. Um, but oh my gosh, Effie, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, you're, you're just such a light. Oh my gosh, Kara. Yeah. You're the best. And like, I, I've, I've always meant to tell you because I'm like, damn it, Kara, I like cannot ever get this, the theme music from your podcast <laughs> out of my head. Like that music and like Dave Jackson's podcast music, like they're the podcast I listen to. And those songs are always stuck in my head. So I'm thinking about you all the time. That's Thank amazing. Thank you for uh, <laughs> having me as a guest on your awesome show. <laughs> oh, it, I mean, it had to happen. Like there was no way we were both going to just keep going and not have each other uh, on each other's shows. So no, thank you so much. Um, y'all have to check out Once Upon a Gene. Go listen to Ford's beautiful laugh. So, and I, I, as you said, I Do challenge it. you not to smile while you hear it. It won't happen. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, everybody go check that out. Um, I listen to it on, on Spotify. You guys can listen to it. Really, any podcast player, I've seen it pop up everywhere. Um, so, yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Yes, Kira, you're the best. And congrats on your awards for your podcast, too. It's amazing. You do such a great job. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.